All right. Did you hear me? You can hear me? That's good. Don't worry, I'm not going to sing. I'm going only to introduce this session. And we have four papers. And we have 25 minutes for each. 50 minutes for speech and 10 minutes for discussion. And um, when people are going to discuss afterwards, please tell me and or us your name and where you are coming from. It's a good idea because people, they don't know each other, uh, perhaps within a small circle of friends, but uh, not everybody here. So, shall we start? Gretar. Or it is... Guess to Hovgård. Hovgård in Danish. Or? Færøsk. Hovgård. Yeah, so now we have learned something new. So, the floor is yours. Okay. Yes, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Jester Hogart. Um, I'm uh, an associate professor at the University of the Faroe Islands, which is a very small university. Um, and since I hear that we are from very different nations here, um, um, this is the region that we are have been worked on, uh, me and, and Greta together. Uh, the Faroe Islands you can see here, um, about 50,000 inhabitants, a small university with about 600 students and a very small social science uh, uh, department. Uh, the background for our presentation is, uh, is that uh, we are trying to, to, to make the, uh, the suggestion of the Icelandic Prime Minister um, realistic. Uh, uh, that we are trying to do some cooperative work um, between Akureyri and, and, and uh, my uh, university. And a couple of years ago we started to, to, to think about this West Nordic uh, region and its future in, in this trend or, uh, of globalization. Uh, but every time we were working on on the future of this region, we return to the issue of what kind of region is actually this uh, um, between these uh, three countries of the Faroe Islands, Greenland and Iceland. So um, we actually started to write a, a paper on West Northern 
a functional region uh, which was uh, published in the Icelandic Review of Politics and Administration this June. Um, so what I'm going to speak about is about what kind of region this West Nordic region is and make some, um, or try to, to give you some conceptual framework for understanding what kind of role this uh, regional unit uh, may play in, in global restructuring. Uh, and finally, uh, present some ideas of a possible future role of, of this regional cooperation. Um, Greta told me that I was the one to do the talking, but he will uh, supplement me when uh, needed. Um, the West Nordic, uh, as a, a regional unit, has a long history. And for us, working with it, there's no doubt that somehow uh, the West Nordic constitute, uh, constitutes a region. Um, if, you, if you look at the, the more theoretical um, conceptualization of what uh, constitutes a, a region, uh, we have used uh, the version that uh, it's a constructivistic defined formation which crosses one or more state boundaries. Uh, and those familiar with the West Nordic knows that the boundaries are not only land, but more characteristically the sea masses that are dividing these three countries. Uh, uh, there are some elements that are needed to constitute the regions, which are, of course, institutions for decision making, uh, economic complementarity, common economic interests, at least to some certain degree, and uh, social interchange and a feeling of affinity among the populations. So uh, if we should talk about a functional region or a region as a, a, a unity or totality, you, you could say that it, it has dimensions of institutional, economical, social, historical, and cultural. Um, the West Nordic has a long history uh, it is, uh, you could say, a part of the more general uh, Nordic cooperation, which was uh, institutionalized uh, many years ago, uh, the Nordic Council, and later the Nordic Council of Ministers. Uh, the, the background for the, the, the institutionalization of, of the West Norton as a region was actually a... Um, a um, an attempt to establish a North, a North Atlantic route um, uh, of transportation between uh, the Iceland, the Faroe Islands, and uh, the coastal uh, or western part of, of Norway back in the 1970s. Um, and that, uh, that succeeded, and that uh, route is still operating. Um, with, you could say with Torsan as some kind of sector. Uh, but you have several other institutions which are within the gen general framework of the Nordic uh, cooperation, but which are, so to say, um, oriented towards the West Nordic. One of them is the West Northern uh, Fund, which is uh, established uh, for loans and guarantees to uh, businesses uh, especially uh, in cooperative businesses between the Faroes and Greenland, uh, but also in uh, some respect uh, uh, in Iceland. Um, it has, in 2011, it uh, was lending out or granted about 20 millions. Uh, because of the, the crisis, it seems that uh, these uh, loans are, are, are decreasing. Uh, but, uh, but the West Nordic Fund is, uh, is an important player for many uh, businesses, in, especially in, in Greenland and the Faroes. Uh, the West Nordic uh, Parliamentarian Committee was established in, in, in 1983. Uh, you could also say it was a natural development from, from the original ideas of, of establishing this uh, North Atlantic uh, uh, route uh, tra of transportation. Um, 
it has um, uh, an aim and goal of cooperation, monitoring resources and culture, contributing to development through the work of the respective parliaments. Um, and it is, you could say, a key forum for uh, the institutionalized West Nordic cooperation on, on a parliamentary uh, level. Um, another institution uh, important for, for West Nordic cooperation is, is NORA. Um, it is, a, uh, you could say, uh, with NORA, the, de the definition, and th this is a part of the problematic that I started with, the West Nordic is uh, by NORA defined to also include coastal Norway. Originally, coastal Norway was, the idea was to include Norway or at least parts of Norway in this, uh, in the development of a region. Uh, one main reason for that was uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the good uh, institutions that Norwegians had on, on uh, science and, uh, and research. And the idea was that somehow these institutions could be developed towards the West. One can say that uh, it has been, this idea has not yet uh, materialized, but uh, of course this is one of the important things to, to discuss and develop further uh, uh, if we are going to discuss or, or see the West Nordic and as an important player in, 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 in the changes that are going on. Um, NORA gives grants for network and innovation activities around the West Nordic. Um, and you could say, generally speaking, that the, it has been a very important institution for many of the projects and ideas that have been developed as, as common uh, projects uh, across uh, the West Nordic over uh, many years now. Um, but as you can see, the fundings are not big. Um, so what we have here is a, is a region uh, divided by waters. Um, um, the land masses are huge, uh, at least in Greenland, not in the Faroe Islands, but it, it covers uh, uh, both uh, big parts of the Arctic, uh, from north to south, um, and from east to west, um, sparsely populated. Um, if we are looking at uh, our definition of, of uh, our regions, they have a common um, heavy reliance on natural resources. The fishing industries are dominant in all three countries, but if you take a brief look, you see no or very little complementarity towards each other. Uh, for instance, in, in, in the trade between the countries, uh, which is very low, it's uh, normally less than 3%, often down to 1% of, of um, economic or, or, or trade between these countries. One of the uh, promising uh, businesses uh, has been tourism. There is some uh, cooperation. It has been very slowly growing uh, in some areas and we in the last uh, few years we have seen uh, improved flight connections which also actually make or can connect uh, Greenland with the Faroe Islands. Um, what first and foremost may constitute the West Nordic as a region is its uh, relationship with East Norden and in particular with Denmark. But one of the uh, problems in West Nordic cooperation is the different constitutional statuses with one independent state and two self-governing uh, nations. Um, and of course if you also include the Nora region or, or the coastal Norway into this uh, um, regional definition, there are a number of subnational units or regions included. Uh, so if we talk of social relations and affinity uh, as a uh, part of, of regionalization, there are of course some degree of, 
cultural economic exchange between these countries uh, which today mostly are made possible by the, by the open Nordic labor market and the educational sectors. We can see that, for example, from the Faroese side that more and more people go to Iceland to study. Um, <clears throat> uh, we can see that uh, many are traveling uh, for, for work. So, um, so in some respect, there are um, a lot of cultural exchange, but we also have to be careful not to overestimate this uh, this uh, cultural uh, affinity, um, because all three countries have um, have strong cultural relations with other parts of the world, uh, especially the indigenous. Uh, uh, part of the world uh, with respect to Greenland uh, and maybe somehow Iceland and Faroe Island is, is the most close uh, the more closer unit when it comes to cultural relations um, it's clear that these um, cultural relations are strong and they have helped to create some kind of common identity uh, which has made it possible to have some kind of regionalization going on. Um, to some respect or to a large extent you could say it's a, a regionalization from below which is very much like the Nordic uh, cooperation in general. Um, but what we have tried to problematize is that uh, we are now living in a new kind of world which um, inevitably pushes to some of uh, of the vital questions uh, of this uh, regional unit. Um, so, so how can the West Nordic, as a regional unit, address itself to to this new agenda? You could say that uh, both the political um, agenda of the West Nordic cooperation has been a very low profile. And you could say that it is rather insufficient for present day's challenges. So, especially on the institutional level, it is important to try to, to strengthen uh, West Nordic cooperation, uh, especially when we are dealing with, uh, with the, the Parliamentarian Committee. One of the ideas that has have been um, coming now and then is that uh, the West Nordic Council also needs some kind of ministerial uh, dimension and that could be one idea to to, to develop further on. Um, on the other hand we also need to, to face the fact that that their interests are very different. Greenland in the high north and the Faroes in the southern part or even south of the Arctic border Another problematic is how how to join Norway into this regional unit, or is Norway at all interested in this, uh, or is Nora more the like a part of the more general uh, Nordic agenda, trying to expand its area of interest uh, towards the west? Um, so, for us, most obviously, it is. Um, higher political significance that is needed and especially and you can look at, at the events over the last weeks with the macro war etc etc uh, somehow uh, Denmark comes between because how, how far can the Faroes and Greenland go in their foreign relations without so to say annoying the Danish state and the last weeks have uh, is, a, is an illustration of the fact that global change is affecting the relationship between Greenland, Faroe Islands, and Denmark. On the other, on the other side, uh, the ban against the Faroe Islands in this, in this herring war that is going on now is, is one uh, example. So, um, so we can ask: uh, Is 
Is there a need of a united uh, structure in the West Nordic, especially in strengthening the West Nordic uh, Parliamentarian Committee, or can we still go on with this fragmented structure or variable structure which uh, the OECD report on the Nora region uh, mentions? Uh, can this structure be maintained, uh, especially in relation to the, the strong position that the Arctic uh, Council has uh, received over the last years? So we could say that maybe there is a need for a new contract between the old and the new Norden. Or, as somebody has said, uh, should the West Nordic uh, Council continue as a, some kind of a coffee club or become a more powerful de developmental actor? Some of the areas that are obvious to develop is, of course, university cooperation, but the mackerel and herring war also shows that the resources are one important issue and the environment. There is actually <coughs> a fairly um, um, scientific report showing that uh, making uh, the pelagic fisheries a common issue for all the West Nordic could be a uh, great ed economic advantage for all the countries. The question is, of course, if that is politically possible. Uh, so, so we could say that somehow the West Nordic cooperation is uh, has to has to find out whether to develop further into this uh, new world that is coming, and something seems to. Um, to um, suggest that they are taking this seriously because yesterday or the day before we found the citation uh, or an article f uh, which was um, an article based on the West Nordic Council meeting in Greenland uh, last week and the new chair, uh, the Icelandic Member of Parliament, uh, Unna Grau Kandasdottir, says um, in her first speech that she was going to put a main emphasis on pushing the governments of Iceland, Greenland, and the Faroes to strengthen the Arctic-oriented cooperation of the three countries, including to secure that the West Nordic Council would get the status as hearing partner in the Arctic uh, Council. The West Nordic Council approved on this annual meeting to apply for such a membership. So you could say that uh, that something is going on which seems to uh, suggest a kind of change in the way that the West Nordic uh, Council has been working uh, for uh, many years now. Uh, Peter, uh, do you have anything to add? Or? We, we haven't found out yet uh, whether this was this thing's a policy was due to our, or but it takes them in two. Okay. I don't think we will get the answer. <laughs> Um, I think that this, uh, of course, uh, you could say that uh, there are some um, um, processes going on, not only uh, in, in, in within the council, but also in, in the political uh, structures of, of each of the countries. Uh, and uh, one of them, uh, I also took a, a citation from in Faroese, uh, from from one of our independence politicians, which does not have so much power, at least at the time being, in the Faroe Islands, but uh, but his dream is that we should create a independent nation in the West with Iceland and Greenland and the Faroe Islands as natural partners, um, because he believes that. The natural resources can be best um, taken care of by a unit between these three countries. So there are some processes going on who are uh, trying to, uh, so to say, to, to push uh, the West Nordic as a region into the uh, future. Thank you. So, on this.
table be behind the wall you find a sample of our attitude. Okay, we have the first question up there. <clears throat> yeah, the, 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 the mackerel war is now a very hot issue, so I think that even people within the independence movement are very carefully not to over, uh, so to say, overestimate or, or, or but, but of course they are trying to take an advantage of this uh, situation, and that is uh, this citation I just mentioned from Höckne Heutel is one of the, one of the examples on that. And the mackerel war and, and uh, the, the, the large-scale law in Greenland, they are examples on how that there, there are and there will come more and more of these uh, conflictive issues uh, with respect to Denmark also in the future, I think. Um, and I agree that it's somehow it seems that the Greenlanders and their self-confidence in in, uh, in uh, um, independence process is, is as things are now on the Faroes are much bigger than in the Faroes. Um, I have not yet seen yet seen any uh, process you could say um, which is strengthening the independence movement on the Faroes yet. It may come, but that will depend very much on the outcome of the uh, of, of this uh, war against EU huh? because we should remember that this is the first time since Second World War that Danish harbors are closed for ferries vessels to get into and how can the Danish unitary state uh, close out a part of the same unitary state uh, within its borders. That is uh, that is a tricky one, and, and, and many in, in Denmark are also questioning this. Now we must have uh, We must end it up here. But, uh, we have five minutes. Okay. I'm going to be fine. I request that when I'm part of it, some people special foresight, and I'm working to address the new Thanks for an interesting presentation. What surprised me that was. He didn't refer at all to this debate on local regional strategies, which is been so important on European agenda the media. So the Baltic local regional strategy, Danny, now recently, uh, Adriatic Union. And I think this local regional level is really the one you are talking about. So mm -hmm. we admit that you don't make a link there. Especially as there are a lot of lessons to be learned from these processes that have been going on for some years. One of them is that maybe the definition of the area is not so important. 
because if you focus on issues rather than track, are we a region, are we not a region? This is an eternal, very academic debate, but the question is maybe, you, I very much appreciate the fact that you said, let's not make this a coffee club. So what are we dealing with? What will this be useful for? And if you talk about transport, maybe West Norway, maybe parts of Denmark would be a natural component of this region. If you talk about university cooperation on fisheries, maybe the market region is more direct going in the direction of Northern Norway, but there you have the fisheries competences, the market, all of this. So I'm just saying that maybe this is a false debate. And this, this, was, and I, this is just one example of that very many of how these market regional processes have been running, which I think we can, we can learn a lot from. Mm -hmm by transposing them to the West Norway context, more of a comment, maybe. Thank you. The, the problem is, is that uh, the West Nordic is, so to speak, got actually a part of the whole Nordic context. And uh, the West Nordic, as we have shown, uh, has, in practice, no power, very little money, and uh, therefore, a little, too little resources or means to uh, try to establish a, a more high politics uh, cooperation. And, uh, but, uh, so, so that, that, that is a little bit of a problem. But, I mean, but, yeah. I mean, the principle, exactly the principle of operating strategies have been no new funds, no new regulation. So, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> the situation. But, well, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Well, this is an article about 20 pages, and, and uh, we are going to write more articles about about it. We are going to continue, but this one was just to uh, get in, uh, on the field with just to wake up the, the question, what, what is this? And we haven't come that much further. We are trying to uh, connect this with uh, Arctic questions. So that's your answer. Uh, short, very short answers. Yes, well, yes, to follow up a little bit. Uh, yeah. I think this is because I think a lot of the discussions that you are referring to had to do with the development back in the 80s and, and uh, part of the 90s, where there was a benefit in connecting with fisheries connected to the region. It's a very different ballgame today because, uh, for instance, uh, fisheries for pelagic fisheries, fish on the east coast of Greenland, is not taking place by Greenland, but by Iceland uh, mainly. Uh, uh, Greenland has a very different position in connection uh, compared to the Faroe Islands on the EU because being uh, with this OLT agreement and getting a grant, a yearly grant of 300 million Danish uh, kroner from the EU, and, and uh, they are probably very unwilling to go into discussions on, on how to uh, well, solve Faroe Islands problems by getting rid of the 300 million uh, eventually. And so I, I think uh, it would be extremely important to find out what is the situation when a fisher is no longer in the dominant activity. In Iceland, it's one third of the national project. Uh, in, in Greenland, it's uh, less than half, definitely. Maybe uh, it's only in Faroe Islands where it's the dominant part of the economy. So what, what is it? Uh, be beyond the public that is actually the, the future of the public right? Otherwise, we have to allow Well, uh, something, uh, something which this micro war also shows is that <laughs> even though the importance of the fishery is, uh, may decline, it's still extremely important for all of these countries. That is, uh, that is one, one issue. Um, um, of course, um, of course um, I think that um, university uh, cooperation would be a, a, a more cooperation on that would be uh, obvious. We have some of the kind of, of the same problems with the, uh, the uh, migration trends, uh, out migration, uh, negative migration trends. Uh, the brain drain problematic and so on and so on. So, uh, so there are a lot of common issues. Uh, now I'm only mentioned the social science perspectives. There are a, lo a lot of other ones too. So, uh, <coughs> these kind of issues would be uh, be very important, I think. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you.
I want to say that uh, we have um, extended the session, not extended, but we were delayed. So we had the lunch at 12.45. That's correct? Yes. So next speakers are Dimitri Simon, Simon from the University of Eastern Finland. You are welcome. <laughs> and it's 50 uh -huh. minutes. Okay, yes. Thank you. So the topic of my speech is uh, uh, the uh, link between climate change and the situation in the Northern Sea Route. Um, Well, uh, the Northern Sea Route was opened for international traffic since uh, 1991. And uh, the main feature of this route is that the microphone. Okay. Uh, uh, and the main uh, uh, feature of this route is that it is uh, uh, much shorter than the traditional route through the Suez Canal. For example, uh, a cargo traveling from Rotterdam to Yokohama uh, would get past this route uh, two weeks shorter than through the Suez Canal. But, so you can see the figures, 7,300 miles through the Northern Sea Route, the red line, or 11,200 miles through the Suez Canal. But there are, of course, major disadvantages of using the Northern Sea Route, such as uh, that the icebreakers' assistance is often required, and the assistance of Russian navigation specialists, sea pilots, is mandatory for ships going through the Northern Sea Route. And uh, the lack of infrastructure makes this route more risky, and therefore uh, insurance companies uh, demand higher fees for ships traveling there. Uh, I haven't seen uh, the precise figures comparing these two routes. There are Russian figures suggesting that, for example, uh, if you travel through the Suez Canal, you pay uh, six and a half dollars per ton of cargo, while when you travel through the Northern Sea Route, you pay just five dollars. So uh, it's more advantage advantageous to go through the Northern Sea Route. Uh, but I'm not sure whether these figures are really, you know, uh, really correct. Because uh, for different types of cargo, there are different figures. And uh, it's difficult to give the precise figure. So, uh, the main modes of uh, the usage of this route today are the delivery of goods to Russian Arctic regions, which can, cannot be reached by roads or railways uh, or air transport, but only through the, this uh, maritime route. Uh, then transportation of locally extracted natural resources, first of all oil and uh, natural gas in liquefied form, uh, and other forms which are much, much less uh, developed, like military, fishing, tourism, and transit shipments. For example, transit traffic remains very modest. Only 46 ships in 2012. So it's no much for the Suez Canal uh, at all. Since the mid uh, 2000s, since the mid of the previous decade, we have seen uh, uh, an increase in Russian engagement in the Arctic region. At least uh, it's possible to name several key documents which the Russian Federal uh, Authority issued on this issue. For instance, Russia's state policy principles in the Arctic till 2020, Russia's climatic doctrine in 2008. And by the way, this climatic doctrine, one of its features was that uh, it proclaims that uh, Russia must uh, develop, develop her own uh, climatic science in order to be independent 
from uh, you know foreign influences in this field. So no matter what foreign scientists say, uh, Russians must uh, check and uh, research uh, what's going on really and uh, trust uh, local sources or, or, or on climatic changes. Uh, then probably the most important uh, development is uh, are the major new projects focusing on exploration, exploitation of natural resources, like the alliance between ExxonMobil and Rosneft, the alliance between Royal Dutch Shell and Gazprom, uh, uh, another agreement on cooperation between China National Petroleum Company and Rosneft uh, and Russian company Novatech, which is going to build uh, their own uh, um, plant producing uh, liquefied natural gas to be exported from a new seaport of Sabetta, uh, which is which lays on the route of uh, Northern Sea Route. Uh, so uh, these are uh, huge projects, multi-billion dollar, each of them. Uh, so far, they are at the initial, very initial stages, and uh, nobody knows whether how they will develop. Uh, in the recent memory, we have the case of the Stockman gas field. Uh, there was an international consortium established for develop, uh, for produce natural gas. And then what happened? Nothing at all. So they decided to postpone it, and uh, nobody knows whether it will proceed uh, any time in the future. So, so although we see these new projects uh, in this list, uh, I wouldn't say that they would be more successful than the Stockman project. But who knows? Then uh, last year, the federal law on the Northern Sea Route was adopted. Uh, it was actually a law introducing amendments to uh, to other laws of the Russian Federation. And one of the key features was the re-establishment of the uh, state administration uh, managing the Northern Sea Route. So, uh, previously such administration existed. It was established in the 30s. And then it existed till 2005. Then the Russian government was uh, reorganized when the Putin was elected for the second term, uh, and it disappeared. So uh, at that time, in 2005, it was considered that it was not necessary. It became a, a, a small department within the Ministry of Transport. And now, in 2012, something changed, and uh, this uh, state administration has been re-established. Uh, and then uh, you see in this list that uh, Russia's Arctic Zone Development Strategy, which was adopted in February this year. Uh, what's interesting is that if you look at the first position here, Russia's state policy principles in the Arctic, and Russia's Arctic Zone Development Strategy, uh, the first document adopted in 2008 uh, uh, actually demanded for Russia to develop the strategy towards its Arctic Zone. And it took whole five years to develop this, this document, yeah, this strategy. But when you look at this document, it's not more than a list of what should be done. We must develop clim climatic science, we must develop our seaports, we must improve uh, uh, public health care and education in the Arctic zone, and uh, things like that. So uh, only, you know, visual thinking. And now uh, this document, this strategy, <laughs> demands that soon a state program for the development of Arctic Zone should be developed, should be created by 2015. And this program must have concrete figures how much Russia is going to spend on the development of the Arctic Zone. Uh, well, uh, if we look at the situation with development of, uh, um, of Russia's preparation for Olympic Games in Sochi, for example, uh, Many billions of rubles has been poured into uh, this Sochi development uh, project. And we saw many stories when uh, budgets were inflated three times for some objects. So uh, we see that uh, it's very difficult for present-day Russia to implement large-scale investment projects. And if we see such a situation, a uh, problematic situation with the uh, Sochi Olympics, uh, in southern Russia, where climate is uh, very good, 
So I can imagine how difficult it might be for Russia to implement very large ambitious programs in the Arctic. So even if a program of development with final figures is adopted, uh, I wouldn't take it that uh, it will be really implemented as it is written. So, all right. Uh, then factors affecting the dynamics of traffic along the Northern Sea Route. First of all, uh, during the last 20 years, we have seen the population of Ra Russian Arctic regions. In practice, many uh, settlements were abandoned. Uh, people migrated to southern regions, and that means that uh, the demand for these uh, deliveries of goods to these northern regions was also diminished. So. Uh, we see uh, a picture of uh, large-scale decay, decay in the, all this Arctic zone in Russia. Then uh, global warming, of course, makes the Arctic cup smaller, ice is melting, and uh, we, we have seen uh, the reports that uh, it's now possible uh, for ships to go along the northern sea route without the assistance of icebreakers for a longer period of time each year. Uh, but at the same time, there is such a phenomenon as shale revolution, especially the growing production of shale gas in the United States. Uh, one of the features of the Stockman projects was that Russia will build a plant producing liquefied natural gas in the Murmansk region in order to deliver this LNG to the market in the United States. And then that market disappeared, so and Stockman disappeared. And now, uh, what's next? Uh, Novatech plans to, to build another LNG plant. Okay, we shall see how it proceeds. Then uh, cases of piracy in the Indian Ocean stimulate some interest towards uh, Northern Sea Route. Uh, I'm not sure uh, is this really so, or at least this is what's suggested in uh, in our uh, in Russian sources. Uh, then the commitment of the Russian state to invest in infrastructure development in order to facilitate extraction of natural resources in the Arctic. At least now the very real project which is going on is the construction of the seaport of Sabetta. Uh, like a joint venture between the Russian state and uh, Novatek private company. Uh, and finally, the, the development of alternative routes and projects. Uh, like, for example, uh, recently President Putin demanded uh, to revive the project Yamal Europe 2 gas pipeline. So, if uh, Russia constructs gas pipelines, then what's the reason for building uh, liquefied natural gas plants? Or if Russia builds uh, uh, this uh, oil pipeline to China, then uh, why tankers should uh, navigate through the Northern Sea Route to China bringing oil when we have the pipeline? Uh, and also Russia has uh, the Trans-Sib, Trans-Siberian Railway uh, line, which can be also somehow a competitor to, for the Northern Sea Route. And uh, uh, projects on Sakhalin, where large-scale oil and gas production um, is going on and uh, aiming at the markets in the Far East, of course. So all these uh, alternative projects, they diminish the demand for the Northern Sea Route. Then developments this year. So this state administration was re-established in early 2013 and started its main, uh, the main purpose of this administration is to issue licenses for ships to go through the Northern Sea Route. So far, uh, during these uh, four months of its operation, it issued 413 licenses, including 10 to the Chinese Ocean Shipping Company, 10 to Stena Bulk, uh, and 6 to Marine West Shipping uh, Cargo Companies in Sweden. So we can see that uh, indeed China uh, is now much more active uh, operator in this Northern Sea Route than it was uh, a year ago, for example. Uh, the administration is headquartered in Moscow, 
but I should say that uh, there was a very strong uh, competition between the regions, between the Russian regions, where the headquarters should be located. Especially the Arkhangelsk region lobbied very hard, uh, so that asking Moscow to locate the headquarters in, in Arkhangelsk, claiming that uh, because uh, two major shipping companies are situated in Arkhangelsk, uh, Northern Fleet, Northern Sea Fleet, and Northern River Fleet are situated in Arkhangelsk, and on this basis, Arkhangelsk demanded uh, Moscow to place headquarters in, in Arkhangelsk. And also Murmansk. But Murmansk uh, got a very large uh, state-funded project on development of the Murmansk seaport. Uh, and so it was... Uh, out, and uh, Murmansk is also important uh, as a Northern Sea Route location because the fleet of icebreakers is uh, located in Murmansk. But uh, Moscow decided to place uh, the administration in Moscow, uh, so that uh, no, no, so that other regions would not argue between themselves <laughs> about why why it was placed in Arkhangelsk and not in Murmansk, and in Murmansk why say why it don't, why it's in Arkhangelsk not in Murmansk. So, uh, but uh, lately a branch of this agency was established in Arkhangelsk. Uh, future expectations. Uh, Russian, I, I have seen different figures suggesting that uh, by 2020 the transit traffic, I mean only transit traffic, will uh, grow from 10 to 20 times during this period. Uh, well, uh, given the fact that uh, some uh, observers suggest that China plans to deliver up to 15% of its international cargo through the Northern Sea Route by 2020, I can imagine that indeed uh, transit cargo may grow by 20 times uh, during this period. Uh, when uh, other Far Eastern countries might be also involved, of course, now uh, China, you know, tests this route, how it will go. And uh, if uh, they f feel that it's uh, succeeding this, then traffic may grow and other countries, Far Eastern countries, may join uh, this queue. Uh, then global recession may, if we see uh, it's uh, more pronounced, then uh, we can expect a fall in oil and gas prices, and which would mean that uh, exploration projects in the Russian Arctic will be frozen or delayed, and so the traffic will not grow very much. And finally, there is the question of global warming or cooling. Uh, I would say that more Russian scientists predict some cooling uh, in 2015-2040 on the basis of the uh, assessments of solar cycles, you know, solar cycles, you know, the, all this story. And that's uh, my feeling, is that this is the, main, the prevailing uh, th uh, thinking in Russia, that we should expect some cooling during this period, after which we shall see some warming. So, that's it. Thank you. You know, I, I haven't seen uh, real uh, economic estimates of uh, uh, how, how much it costs for different uh, routes to ship uh, goods. So uh, it's hard to say. Uh, m my feeling is that Northern Sea Route is in no way a competitor for the Suez Canal route anytime soon. Uh, nothing more I can say. Can I ask you to tell us maybe why 
No, I'm not suggesting that it is not economical. I, I think that, uh, well, for different types of cargo, uh, for example, container ships don't go through the Northern Sea Route at all, and they all go through the Suez Canal. Uh, so Russia needs to make huge investments in upgrading the infrastructure to, to show that what, what happens if there is an oil spill in the Kara Sea. What, what shall we do about it? Can we do anything about it now? Not at all. And that's why uh, shipping companies have to pay huge uh, insurance fees for, for, to compensate for this. So uh, it depends on how Russia, whether Russia is able to develop this uh, Arctic zone, really, which I doubt in the short or medium term. That's why I think it will not be a competitor. Uh, otherwise, uh, I, I'm not a specialist on climate. And if uh, Russian scientists say that it will be cooling uh, within the next uh, two decades, then what? The ice uh, situation will be uh, more problematic. Uh, uh, companies will have to pay ice breakers. So it will return to the situation in the 1990s. And uh, what competition then? Well, at least there are, this is one of the priorities of the Russian uh, Arctic strategy, to develop a monitoring system, to develop even a network of satellites which would uh, look in the Arctic to, to improve communication in this area, to somehow better predict climate changes, to help in rescue operations. Uh, but on the other hand, if we look at uh, the Russian experience with uh, this uh, system, uh, of global positioning, forgot its name. Uh, so it didn't develop as expected. So uh, there are good reasons to doubt that uh, Russia will, uh, you know, succeed it very fast in, in this field. Okay, thank you. Hello, Johanna. Okay, and uh, hello to everyone, and uh, my presentation is one of those few ESPON-related uh, presentations in this uh, conference, uh, balancing between the ENECON and uh, Northern Research Forum. And what I'm now going to present with the title The Arctic Europe Strategic Neighborhood is uh, based on the, our tentative results from the ESPON uh, ITAN project. And ESPON ITAN is an acronym coming from uh, integrated territorial analysis of the neighborhood. And the aim of the project is more or less presenting a comparative view of the European neighboring regions, where in the, with the project we have the four different uh, neighboring regions for uh, the European space, meaning the southern neighborhood, southeastern neighborhood, eastern, and 
then we have picked up the northern or Arctic neighborhood as a region of its own. And what are the, otherwise, the, uh, the project is assessing the territorial integration between the Espon space and the neighboring regions through a territorial analysis. And uh, in the first stage of this project, what we have now more or less finalized is to build a coherent database and connect that with the ESPN database, uh, meaning a lot of uh, territorial level data, so in more or less uh, the statistical evidence about the development and state of the neighboring regions. And in the project we are also at least trying to make uh, recommendations in order to reduce risk and uh, foster opportunities between uh, Europe and the Arctic. And, uh, what I'm going to summarize at the end of this project is more or less these uh, two main project hypotheses. The first one, the neighborhoods present opportunities for Europe rather than threats. And Europe and the European neighbor regions could be seen as one region in light of functional integration. So how we understand uh, the Arctic region in the Ethan project is that we are doing some form of circumpolar comparison, but only in a very limited level. We are more or less focusing on the West Nordic region, where you already got a very nice overview of the station by Gestur and Greta, but also to the development trends in the Barents region. So, what we are focusing mostly in uh, just in this Arctic or Northern case study part of the Eden project is that in what sense can the spatial structure of the Arctic area be understood as a one region? And what are the common links and flows between the Arctic and Europe? And then is the very trick question, why is the Arctic important for Europe? But also, why Europe is important for the Arctic? Or is it really so? And what are the drivers of integration in the Arctic itself and uh, with the rest of the Europe? And then it's going a bit for more in the analyzing part that what are the territorial potentials for cooperation and how has climate change changed the potentials or preconditions. And how we have continued this project is more or less is starting from the bit more uh, statistical part where we have been map mapping the territorial structure of the Arctic region from uh, the set of indicators what we have collected for the, all the neighboring regions of the Espon space. Then we are going further for understanding the role of uh, territorial capital, national resources and the effects of climate change on them and that part has been more or less based on the literature review and a more uh, qualitative analysis. Then one our project partner is going to work a bit more with the mapping the existing flows of goods and peoples and their potentials between Europe and Arctic but I'm not going to go further in that part. And finally we are more thinking about analyzing the form of intergovernmental and territorial cooperation. But if we start with the part of the territorial structure, so in what do we see and what have been the latest development trends, there have been very much focus in the quantitative evidence, in the statistics. First of thinking that what have been the territory itself, how the regions have been defined, and is, there a, is it a question about the national differences? Is it a question about the regional differences? And the question about are we just uh, saying that this is the situation today, this is what you see, or should be more focused on the development trends during the latest years, just to do the, what is happening in the regions in the better context, because it's not always that easy when you are making uh, larger comparisons. It's rather easy for us when we are working just the northern neighborhood say that how the development is going, but when we are suddenly within the whole ETAN project comparing the development in the Arctic to the development in the North Africa, we are a bit talking about the different uh, challenges. And thematically, the main focus in this uh, setting the scheme or so in the state of the neighboring region have been in demographics, labor markets and economic themes. But then within each neighborhood, we have also been focusing a bit more team specific issues like uh, environment, accessibility, and climate change, what comes to the northern neighborhood. 
First of all, it's also before you are putting any statistics on the map, it's very important also to think that what are the preconditions for the human habitats and economic activities. Of course, in the Arctic region, we can't really say that the climate have no importance because then we would be a bit lost for, as a starting point. But thinking about the population when we are always thinking about the Arctic itself, it's always referred that we are talking about a very sparsely populated region where some 4 million people are living in the all over certain part of the Arctic. But at the same time, we who are here in the room are mostly coming from that part of the Arctic or in the countries surrounding the Arctic, which is actually the most densely populated part. So in that sense, we have a bit different challenges compared to other parts of the circumpolar Arctic. But at the same time, even sparsely populated, heavily concentrated in the limited number of settlements. But the people itself, it's not just the saying that, yes, we have people there, they are concentrated, and we should just say that, okay, we have less people, but we are as good as whoever. But then it's the challenges of the population and demographic structure. Is there a balance between males and females? How does the age structure look like? If we are just looking the thematical map that is showing the share of young people, for example, the Arctic region, it looks nice. There's a lot of young people living in the Arctic. In that sense, it looks good for the original potentials. But then the map is not saying that there is a huge out-migration of young people, especially younger females. So it's not maybe that much supporting for the sustainable development of the demographic pattern. But what comes to the questions of accessibility, as already cited here, and think about that we are sparsely populated, but even to get an understanding from the European perspective that what is really sparsely populated. For me, it, we were like thinking yesterday, driving from the Keflavik to Akure, every six hours, it was actually still a very short distance compared to many other parts of the Arctic wheel. You don't actually have even the road how to drive to the next settlement. And then you are not really talking about the same uh, challenges of accessibility than in the central parts of the Europe where people are complaining that it takes so long time to travel when you at least have some basic opportunities for that. Of course, the traffic jams can make the travel time a bit longer than the same distance in the Arctic. In that case, you have the road. But also thinking about the employment pattern. We have been a lot of discussing that, what is the role of the tradi traditional livelihoods, especially mentally and culturally, and we should not ignore those. And of course, that there is a question about the large-scale resource harvestments, especially to the oil, gas, uh, minerals, which are a lot of the agenda when you are thinking about the Arctic region from the European point of view. But at the same time, it should be highlighted that even these issues have the local importance for the Arctic region. Service sector is still the dominant part of employment, and in that sense it doesn't really change the overall employment pattern and the economics compared to many other well-developed uh, industrial countries. It's just taking an uh, overall large-scale picture, not going to the local details that, of course, are a bit more different. So, when we have been put in the, setting the scheme, it's more the question that, what is then this territory or capital, what we are talking about in this region? And uh, in this sense, we were referring to the definition from the OECD, citing that territory or capital refers to the stock of assets, which form the basis for the indigenous development in each city and region as well as to the institutions, modes of decision making, and professional skills to the best uh, use of those assets. And this includes uh, very many different types of assets from geographic location, sites, climate, natural resources, but also a bit more foggy issues like quality of life, agglomeration economies, there's something in the air, issues that are not that easy to measure. So we're continuing a bit to work from uh, some of our colleagues who have been working with the Edora project, where they were talking uh, uh, about the material and immaterial aspects of the territorial capital. And 
when we were thinking that what does this really mean in the Arctic context, we were thinking that yeah, in the Arctic we can see some rivalry over the goods that are both public and private. But uh, could we even, like argue that uh, could these assets be seen as uh, club guards, for example, belonging to those in the Arctic state clubs, or how should we understand or get started with these issues? But also, when it comes to the climate change, we can we were thinking we should maybe see that also as a part of the territorial capital. Of course, it's the issue that how to adopt to the issues and how to see different issues, but uh, still it's uh, something that people in the region have been living with. But also the challenge of uh, understanding that from the local perspective it can mostly be seen as a challenge, but at the same time when we're talking about the uh, European point of view when they are talking about that the accessibility is coming better and it's easier to access these resources, it's suddenly we are hearing that it's more seen as a potential from those policymakers, which is making a bit like a paradox. What are we looking after? And then of course the question about the new potential accessibility and for the question about the new shipping lines, but I think Dimitri made already a fabulous job about presenting this one, so going to the next topic about the thinking about the for example, minerals, oils, and gas as a form of territorial capital in the Arctic region. Of course, it's the question about that the Arctic region has many prospective areas and reserves, but of course, it's still a very heavily question about the accessibility, and even more is the question that how are the global markets developing? Because those are totally impacting the, how the development of is going, because it's so much heavily dependent on that. We have, for example, here the question about the uh, stockman that Dimitri were already referring about the uh, gas file. We have been a huge development project in the latest years and a lot of discussion, and now because of the shade oils have been more or less dumped. So it's more or less very much question about the changing balances. And same goes in the northern part of Finland, Sweden and Norway with the mining boom, for example, when there have been a lot of efforts to build and get started and local communities have been really focusing and eager and seen the development and now a couple of those companies have to just get bankrupt in the latest couple of months. So it's very hard to say what is real the future of these activities when regions are not that independent on the, the deciding how the development is going. But also not to forget that there is a very huge security concerns. Of course, the, there are some positive signs, for example, the agreement on cooperation, marine pollution, preparedness and response to the Arctic that was adopted in the latest Arctic Council's meeting. But it's really like a thinking that uh, if we are going to use these territorial capitals in the Arctic region, we should not forget that there can be costs and those can be very bad ones for the development in the long run. So, flows, I will just, just, I will skip. But then is the question about the Arctic uh, cooperation. So, it's more or less like thinking, can territorial cooperation itself present the type of uh, territorial capital? And we were thinking that, yes, but why not? Because climate change or exposure to new resources, greater accessibility, changing territorial precondition, those are actually leading to increased form of governance, of course, in differences in the scope and intensity. But at the same time, are they talking cooperation but preparing for conflict, as Hubert was wondering a couple of years ago? And thinking that Arctic cooperation is contributing to greater integration and defining the neighborhood with important links to the rest of the Europe, or opposite. So just uh, trying to show a, a small overview, but uh, there is actually a lot of initiatives, uh, policy agreements, local agreements, NGOs who are actually working very heavily with this Arctic cooperation program. But it's not always uh, very clear what are the 
roles of the different institutions, what is the power of the different institutions, how those are overlapping, how those are cooperating between each other. So then we have a bit still something to do even the signs have been too good. So thinking about the our tentative conclusions from the project. The first hypothesis was, is the Arctic neighborhood a threat or potential? And uh, we were arguing that it can be both, as there is strong territorial capital in the region, but the current territorial structures make it somewhat vulnerable. Climate change both helps to free up material territorial capital, but could worsen the immaterial capital. And in that sense, territorial cooperation can focus on the potentials just as dealing with the immaterial aspects of the climate change. And the second question or hypothesis, can the Arctic region and Europe be seen as one region? And we were thinking that functionally, the flows between Arctic and rest of the Europe and why not the, the other parts of the world are expected to increase. But the existing territorial structure, however, is still distinct from many aspects of the Europe and could somehow limit the territorial potentials for cooperation. And still cooperation could help highlight the continuities of the neighborhood with other parts of the Europe. So as much is still standing there, I will just say thank you and thank you. <laughs> well, we have a lot of time meetings with questions. <laughs> Well, for the project itself, we don't have the power to say, but it, of course it would be nice if that could be used some kind of basic material because we have been focusing a lot of uh, saying like the, the mapping the basic situation, the structures, uh, highlighting the ter ter capital issues. So hopefully that could be something that could be used as uh, background material, for example. But of course there is a, we are supposed to follow the development of the strategy and ex and uh, the status at the moment within the analysis of the neighboring region. More questions? Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, what is more, what you see as more effective? Speed of change. I think that uh, uh, ethnic president put it very nicely in the morning that, that the changes in the Arctic is happening so fastly. So how to respond to all of these changes is not just the people, people are very adaptive as a starting point. But if you have to adapt in every sector of your life, then it comes a very puzzle when it's not just adapting in the one sector, for example, in your private life or your living conditions or in your work, but if it's more or less like at a complexity that everything is changing in your life, in your environment, in the societies. So putting all of these pieces together, that will make a biggest challenge. <laughs> okay. So now the last paper. Okay. Thank yes, you. We need a lucky fish. Yeah. Note from the University of East of Kingdom. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Mr. Chairman, dear colleagues, <laughs> fortunately, my uh, this presentation is uh, or can be very, very brief. Uh, this uh, overview, uh, uh, this is an overview with uh, some reflections on the Arctic dimension in Finnish regional policy. It's co-authored uh, uh, by, by Matti Fritsch up there. 
uh, Finland is uh, uh, one of the countries uh, where uh, Arctic issues uh, have risen in importance on the national political agenda and also in uh, uh, regional development policies uh, in the northern part of the country. As you know, Finland is not uh, currently a literal state of the Arctic Ocean. Uh, it was a literal state between the two world wars. Finland is currently a member of the Arctic Council and according to most definitions, social political definition, it's mostly northernmost part of Finland, Lapland, which is about one third of, Win uh, of, of Finland, if you look at the area, is uh, part of the Arctic uh, region. And, uh, and in this uh, uh, overview, uh, I look at, uh, I look at uh, uh, Arctic issues in regional development policy in Finnish Lapland or for Finnish Lapland in the national context or in the wider context. Uh, uh, more specifically, how uh, have uh, various uh, framework conditions, not only this issue uh, of uh, climate change, but uh, geopolitics, uh, changing debates on territorial development strategies, how they have reflected on this. Um, uh, Perhaps to cut uh, a long story very, very short, I can say that traditionally this northernmost part of Finland, Lapland, has been seen as an archetypical problem region in Finland, of this out-migration, geographical, relational, peripherality, peripherality syndrome, lagging socio-economic development and such issues. And so it's been a focus area. Of in, in Finnish regional policy, comparable to the eastern part of the country, uh, the border, eastern border regions of the country. And so there is a very long, stra long tradition of regional policy uh, measures, uh, starting from war reparations uh, uh, after the Second World War, then uh, it was a sort of a testing ground for regional policy measures from the 50s onwards, uh, and uh, uh, what's interesting in this uh, is that uh, uh, throughout this period, uh, Lapland has also been seen as a, as a region with uh, some specific resources, uh, such as uh, energy or tourist potential, etc. And the current uh, debate uh, on regional development strategies can be or should be seen against this background. And typically the approach was very, this in domestic development policies was uh, very much inward looking, inward looking, okay, North Calat cooperation with its long history is an exception, but uh, looking inside, this was uh, a relatively small part of this uh, this uh, this policy and uh, geopolitics geopolitical considerations were important uh, uh, in practice in in this policy Norway as a NATO member country and and Soviet Union as the neighbor simply closed border of course then uh, throughout the country if we look at regional policies uh, as a whole in a wider perspective we can see that this, uh, what is sometimes called large regional policy, had major impact, uh, impact uh, on living conditions and regional disparities. But it was not uh, 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 this uh, this earmarked uh, regional policy measures were a different thing. Now, what we have uh, been witnessing since 1990, this. Uh, normalization of the eastern border after the collapse of the Soviet Union is an important thing and uh, resulting cross-border cooperation uh, later uh, 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 in, in terms of these European programs. 
but it started already in the early 1990s. And then uh, uh, as a result or, or after Finland's accession, uh, important shifts. Regional councils show regional actors, in this case Lapland, in Lapland, got a more important role in policy making. What was important that the specific conditions of the region were recognized by the European Union, especially this sparsity of, and, and, and in particular, uh, the, the sparsity of population, uh, population density in the beginning, and then, then this sparsity is uh, defined in, <laughs> or, or is, is seen in more analytical terms later. And so the region was eligible for a specific support and this support has continued and what's important uh, is that this uh, this has been uh, uh, identified the European Union also in the Lisbon Treaty. Uh, Lapland or sparsely populated regions, northern regions are seen as a, a specific category of disadvantages region. And uh, these northern regions have cooperated with each other. Uh, I'm referring here to cooperation between uh, northern northernmost region, regions in uh, Norway, Sweden, in some cases Scotland, and and Finland. And in Finland, this has uh, this cooperation has uh, included eastern part of the country. Now. Uh, Arctic issues have entered this scene. As I said, Arctic dimension was not important in domestic regional development policy. Uh, uh, after in, in post World War, World War II decades, this geopolitical setting was important here. And now it is seen increasingly as a potential and additional Research, resource in development policy. Uh, very briefly, three, three examples of this uh, this uh, rising importance of these issues in development policy. If you look at the current uh, Lapland Regional Development Program, it uh, outlines uh, four scenarios for Lapland. Uh, one of them, seen as the uh, Number two, not the best one, but <laughs> the number two is what could be uh, translated the call of the parents. And uh, the very straightforward uh, strategy or outline of the strategy is to benefit from, from uh, assumed Norwegian and Russian large scale development projects. These new transport corridors, of course. And, and uh, and uh, all this against the background of climate change. And then there's much more, even more than uh, earlier, uh, uh, emphasis on these specificities, climate, vast space, uh, and uh, tourism various testing facilities. So this harsh, harsh climate and, and in some cases low accessibility are increasingly interpreted as uh, as resources then another uh, second uh, uh, and in the Finnish context very important uh, initiatives is a development program for eastern and northern and eastern Finland in in Finland uh, this can be okay this can be seen as a tactical move in the sense that when Lisbon Treaty is uh, read in Finland. It's realized that uh, northern and eastern Finland uh, form this uh, this uh, specific region, and so so they were re defined wa as one single, not two level statistical region in Finland for this purpose. And uh, the government appointed a specific uh, group, working group, uh, and. Uh, According to its report, uh, or it, uh, this group sees northern and eastern Finland as a region of rise, uh, rising opportunities that has potential for strong 
growth and could even be an engine for the development of the entire country. And uh, arguments again, unique natural resources, world-class expertise and know-how, strategic lo location. And, and Arctic is in the core of the first uh, focal area for development. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, this is important initiative. Uh, okay, at a relatively general level, but currently it is the official approach to <laughs> to to the development of this uh, traditionally lagging region in Finland. And uh, reading this uh, strategy, it's clear that the the focus is really on this arctic related aspects of the uh, 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 characteristics and, and uh, resources of the of the region uh, in the domestic context this is uh, quite problematic because uh, a fact is that uh, this uh, really uh, concerns uh, northern part of the country not the eastern part of the country where this Arctic connection is not at all important. Where these two come together is uh, this, uh, the importance of, of the Russian connection. And then uh, third story would be the Finnish Arctic strategy, the national strategy. It's currently being revised. Uh, uh, and. Uh, 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 also in this strategy, uh, Finnish Lapland uh, as Finland's Arctic region uh, is assigned a specific task in this wider circumpolar world and it's put forward as an information center, sort of EU's, uh, uh, in the EU context, logistical center, transport corridor. Uh, so there's much interest in the possible development of these transshipment points or major um, port investments in the high north. Of course, Finland is 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 an out, outsider in a way in this context, but very closely closely following it, and 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 uh, there's much interest in the further de development of this. And uh, summarizing the whole story briefly. Uh, if we look at uh, this uh, in terms of uh, 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 European debate on development strategies, this would be a longer story in the Espon context, but, but uh, 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 there's much more emphasis on specific territorial capital in the region. Johanna Rotto already discussed uh, Arctic territorial capital resources, climate, location. And uh, then there's the argument that uh, this is not only for the region, but for, for Finland as a whole and even for the European Union. And as I said, uh, the, in the Finnish context, uh, this, uh, this is uh, not uh, that uh, straightforward uh, this story is uh, uh, promoted uh, and sold to the European Union, but in the domestic context it's more problematic. Finland is a vast country and this Arctic uh, aspect specifically concerns only the part of the sparsely populated Finland. And uh, then uh, reading these uh, documents, uh, Climate change is, of course, seen as a major background factor. In fact, in very positive terms. This is, of course, uh, quite paradoxical because there is no discussion, almost no discussion, on its, uh, uh, on the problems, on the problems and 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 solutions to this problem. But it is discussed as a resource in in the regional context and in the wider national context. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This is the whole story. Thank you, thank you. Now we have five minutes for questions.
And then we have used nine, nine, one of our minutes. And we were 20 minutes delayed when we started. Okay? So it's uh, very good. It is, uh, it is in this audience. What? Thank you, too. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, you said there was the that there was kind of a, a review that that uh, global warming or climate change was a positive thing. Is that the general consensus in in northern Finland among indigenous peoples as well, or is that kind of a government official discourse? I of course there are many people who see it as a major problem and uh, <laughs> uh, but but when when you read this uh, these documents like uh, regional development policy documents uh, they they form a separate category and and uh, this uh, for instance this uh, important document uh, written by this uh, government appointed group there's no discussion on these uh, problems it's a, it's a resource and it's a specific form of territorial capital in the in this region and uh, then let's look for the opportunities. This is one discourse. There are several discourses, of course. And also at the regional level, the, this is uh, the mainstream discourse. Uh, then uh, indigenous people in this context, okay, they get the, their own pages and their culture and, and such uh, initiatives, but, but uh, uh, these are different strands of these causes. Yes, uh, Finland is a large country, and the uh, eastern part of Finland, uh, it's, uh, it is uh, mm, closer to the capital, its settlement pattern is different in comparison to northern Finland, but both fulfill this uh, criteria of very low average density, and so uh, typically development strategies in eastern Finland, they they, they focus on the development of the Russian connection. In fact, St. Petersburg is the more important place than the much more important place than the Arctic. <laughs> and and, and uh, they, they, it's uh, very weakly connected uh, to the Arctic region, in fact. And, and so it's an outsider. So that's, uh, this means, what I try to say, that it's a different story to those European and, uh, and uh, uh, in comparison uh, to the policy uh, debate and uh, strategy development in All right, so we close this session. Thank you all. <laughs>